அவர் தன்னுடைய பட்டத்தை கலாநிதி பட்டத்தை அறுபத்தி ஒன்பதாவது ஆண்டில் பெற்றதுடன் பல்கலைக்கழகத்தில் தொடர்ந்து கல்விசார் நடவடிக்கைகள் பேராசனை யாழ்ப்பாண பல்கலைக்கழகம் இங்கு அவர் பேராசிரியராக கடமையாற்றி பின்னர் காலத்தில் இங்கு நிகழ்ந்த உள்நாட்டு பிரச்சனைகளினால் அவர் திரும்ப பேராசனை பல்கலைக்கழகத்துக்கு சென்று தனது பகுதியை தனது பதவியை தொடர்ந்தவர் குறிப்பாக ஏனைய தமிழ் பல்கலைக்கழகம் கிழக்கு பல்கலைக்கழகம் கிழக்கு பல்கலைக்கழகம் போன்றவற்றில் கூட அவர் தன்னுடைய பங்கை ஆற்றியுள்ள தென்கிழக்கு பல்கலைக்கழகத்தில் இந்து கற்கை தேவையான அடித்தளத்தை இட்டவர் பேராசிரியர் பத்மநாதன் என்று கூறும் பொழுது நாங்கள் அவருடைய அவரை மற்றவர்கள் ஏற்கின்ற தன்மை இந்த பாடத்துக்குள் புலம்பிக் கொள்ள முடியும் கிழக்கு பல்கலைக்கழகத்தில் அவர் வருகை விரிப்பாளராக பல காலம் அங்கே கடமை புரிந்து பல மாணாக்கர்களையும் பல ஆசிரியர்களையும் விரிவுரையாளர்களையும் அங்கே உருவாக்கி உள்ள அப்படியான பல கல்வி தகவல்களையும் கல்வி நடவடிக்கைகளை தனது பங்கை ஆற்றிய பேராசிரியர் பத்மநாதன் எங்களுடைய பல்கலைக்கழகத்தின் வேந்தராக பதவி வகுப்பது நாங்கள் ஒரு பெருமைப்படக்கூடிய ஒரு விடயம் ஆகும் அப்படிப்பட்ட பெருந்தகை இன்று நமக்கு ஒரு சொற்பொழிவை ஆற்றுவதற்கு முன்வந்தவை நாங்கள் கொடுக்க செய்த ஒரு பெரிய புண்ணியமாகும் அதனுடைய ஆங்கில வாசகத்தை நான் வாசிக்கின்றேன் டிஸ்ட்ரிபியூஷன் ஆஃப் அதோரிட்டி அண்ட் கோ எக்ஸிஸ்டன்ஸ் ஆஃப் எதினிக் குரூப்ஸ் த கண்டியன் கிங்டம் ஆயிரத்தி நானூற்றி எழுபத்தி நாலிலிருந்து ஆயிரத்தி எண்ணூற்றி பதினைந்து ஆண்டு காலப்பகுதியில் கண்டியில் நடந்த சாம்ராஜ்யத்தின் பவரின் பரம்பரையும் எதினிக்கும் சேர்ந்திருக்கின்ற கோ எக்ஸிஸ்டன்ஸை பற்றிய அந்த விரிவுரைய விரிவுரையை நாங்கள் கேட்க இருக்கின்றோம் அது எங்களுக்கு பிரயோஜனமானதாக அமையும் குறிப்பாக எங்கள் பல்கலைக்கழக மாணவர்களுக்கு இது ஒரு நல்ல உரையாக பாடத்திற்குடத்துடன் அமைந்த ஒரு உரையாக இருக்கும் என்ற நம்பிக்கையும் அதை எல்லாவற்றையும் விட நான் எப்பொழுதும் பல உடையங்களுக்கு என்னுடைய கஷ்டங்களை பாராமல் இப்படியான விரிவுரைகளுக்கு செல்வது வழக்கம் ஏனெனில் கற்றவர் துறை சார் கல்வியில் நன் நல்ல பாண்டித்யம் பெற்றவர்கள் எங்களுக்கு ஒரு மனத்தியாலத்தில் கூறுகின்ற கல்வி அறிவை விடயங்களை நாங்கள் ரெண்டரை வருஷம் படித்தாலும் வாசித்தாலும் எங்களால் முழுவதாக அறிந்து கொள்ள இயலாத என்ற அந்த விடயத்தில் நம்பிக்கை உள்ளவர் என்ற முறையிலும் மாணவர்களே உங்களுக்கு ஒரு நல்ல சந்தர்ப்பகமாகும் ஆனபடிய கவனமாக இந்த விடயங்களை மனத்தில் இருத்திக் கொள்ளுங்கள் என்று கூறி பேராசிரியர் பத்மநாதன் அவர்களை தனது உரையை தொடங்குமாறு இணையமாக கேட்பதில் சந்தோஷப்பட்டு உங்களிடமிருந்து விடைபெறுகின்றேன் whom I have known for a period of 50 years, Mr. Perumbanayam, who is one of the surviving organizers of the fourth IITR conference, about which many of you may not know because you have been born very recently. 
and other academics and dear students. I have pleasure in being here with you this afternoon. The paper that I am presenting here consists of three parts as indicated in the video group that will be supplied to you. The first part is a description, a very, very brief description of the kingdom of Delhi. The second focuses attention on the main theme of the paper, that is the constitution of the kingdom. And the third part is on the eastern littoral from the northern frontiers of Patrikul and Patri to the south, southern boundaries of Parliament, which was a large, long strip of territory on, a, on either side of the Lagoon, which was also part of the kingdom of Kendi during the whole day of its fall. But unfortunately, the court principal contributor on the Kandyan kingdom in many of our chapters has some or other by design or for some other reason left out any description, even a brief description of this part of the kingdom of Kandy. You may wonder why I have selected this theme for presentation today. There is a special reason because I want to focus attention on how far we have moved away from the traditions and exemplary values that have been set up under the monarchy during uh, a period, a long history of 2000 years. Ironically, this has been done, this departure from the heritage of the country, from the traditions established during a long history, starts with the dawn of independence. We have moved far away, and still, I don't know whether we will move to the extremity which will lead to a nemesis. Probably you understand what I say in an academic presentation. I cannot say anything but the, in the 16th century, when the Portuguese came to this island, there were three kingdoms. Those of Kote, Jaffna and Kandy. Some years later, the kingdom of Kote broke up into two units, and this disruption gave an opportunity for the Portuguese who had come for trade to entrench themselves as a political and military force in the western coast of the island. The kingdom of Kote was the largest, the most affluent, as it produced some of the products, particularly cinnamon, pepper, arecanets, and other commodities, which were in great demand. These were at that time priceless commodities in international trade. As usual, they were taken to the coastal ports in South India and from there distributed by merchants who came there in the Middle East and Europe and the Chinese also came in substantial numbers. The Kota Kingdom was militarily powerful and at the same time there was a large concentration of the population. I think more than 40% 
of the island's population at the time uh, were to be found in that kingdom. The kingdom of Jatna, which in the days of its decline corresponded to the areas included in the Nagorno Karabakh province, was largely predominantly occupied by Tamils. At that time, they were mostly Shaivites, and as very deep connections, close connections, politically, economically, and culturally, with the succession states of the Vijayanagara Empire in the Tamil country. This it was dominated by the Nayaks of Madura and Tanjavu. And in the late 15th century and the early 16th century, these kings of Japna were tributary to the Nayaks of Tango, nominally, and they lose that position to ward off threats from the south. There was no possibility of an invasion from Fort Lee or Kelly. And the kings of Japna also, particularly Chandiri and Parvati Sagar, who ruled towards the end of the 16th century, were supportive of the rulers of Sikabaka and Kandi in their struggles against the Portuguese. But I only who wrote a comprehensive history, the first of its kind on the island, focusing greater attention, of course, on the period of Portuguese rule and the immediately preceding era, says that Shangri persuaded Madura to continue the war against the Portuguese to save the Buddhism and promise military help. Nowadays, in the histories of the island, this is a forgotten chapter aspect. One of the last things of uh, Jaffna, Paradraja Chagan, although he was a Portuguese potentiate, in order to ensure his existence, thought that the independence of Kandi was then vital. So what he did was, on behalf of Kandi, he conducted negotiations with the South Indian Nayaka states, and at the same time, offered his kingdom as an avenue for the transit of military recruits for the Kandian armies. Having said this, I must say two things. Uh, first, about the origins and development of this kind of thing. With all this confusion, if you read the universities of Luxembourg, volume one, part two, and volume two, uh, you find that they are not. They do coherence. Uh, they do great, great deal of divergence of opinion. The, Kingdom of Kandy is often referred to as Kanda Udapasrata. That means it was a union of five principalities in the mountainous part of the country. And the regions in the upper reaches of the mountains were also dated, included within this kingdom. It was a landlocked area, very sparsely populated in ancient times, and, deeply, uh, and was not very rich in resources. But by about the 13th century, there was a steady growth of population, and also a development of the economy, because at that time, spices, like cinnamon, pepper, and alternate, which were also the products of this mountainous region, were sent abroad. It was landlocked, 
the chief ports for the for intercourse for the Canadians in the outside world were the were those of Portyard and Belgium. They were highly deficient in food uh, in rice, so rice and growth and several other items were brought from the eastern strip of territory by caravans of Muslims and sometimes some Shatiyas. The trade uh, items, uh, the eastern coast, of course, Professor Henry Simba wrongly, wrongly describes it as a Siberia of 18th and uh, early modern Ceylon. If you have to look for a Siberia at that time, it would have, it would have been necessary to go to Uwar Kalabia or Taman Kalabia. Professor Kushner, let me smile. I say this because the eastern coast, the particularly Batikaro, Matakara Pradesha, according to Father Queros, was economically very productive. There was a surplus uh, production of rice, an abundance of fish, cattle and poultry, and also citrus fruits, and he says, prices of commodities were the cheapest in this region compared to all other parts. So you may know from this that it could not be considered as the same. Foodstuffs, particularly rice, produced in the eastern region were taken to Japan and to Pote and particularly to the Canadian Kingdom in large numbers. This region was known as Malaya Desha in the late Amuradha period and it was uh, under the charge of a prince or another dictatorate appointed by the king. We don't know how it was administered. Two decades have been kept. In, uh, there are no records of this, uh, of the, any administrative activities. The revenues were very, very limited, and it was a nominal overlordship of the ruler of Arabat. In the Polar Rover period, the same trend continued, but it became strategically more important because at the time in the early 12th century, it uh, they had worked two warring principalities, that is Rajanatta, the ruler based in Polanarpa, was being attacked by his cousins from Rona for sovereignty over the island. When I say sovereignty, we should not identify or take it in the modern sense of that term. Because in South Asia, sovereignty was not understood as it was done in medieval and modern world. Because they also, modern historians, have the tendency to imagine many things, despite their training in London, Oxford or Harvard. When they write about the early modern and medieval history, they begin to present the history as one of a centralized administration. When it comes to Kandy, it was a feudal system, not entirely identical with that of Europe. One of the most sober and brilliant academics of this country, Professor Karana Abhayasilakata has said, he has heard him say several times, that the Kandyan administration was a highly decentralized administration. I will come to that later. 
So this, uh, this, this first letter consisted of five divisions. Gampara, Sirurvan, consisting of Yatimura and Uruvara, Baragita, Parispatra and Matare. These were the five divisions or principalities which united to form the kingdom of Kali. In the 14th century, there was a, the, it was, Gampara was a seat of the royalty who exercised sway over and target. The kingdom of Gampara, so called after it was occupied by Bone Rabahu the Fourth, contained two large segments. That is, the Udarata, the hill country, the core of which was what was later known as Pasbata, and the low country that so when the court, when the capital of the kingdom was shifted from Gampara to Kote, the rulers of Kote lost control over Udaraki. And these principalities became autonomous. Some of them for purposes of their independent existence, that means the to prevent the ruler of Kote from collecting revenues which were exciting, which they did not like, they formed this thing. And Sena Samara Vikramabhu is credited by modern historians as the first founder of the kingdom of uh, the first letter of the I am to remind you that there is a two divergent opinions are expressed about the reign of Vikram. Dr. T. B. H. Akhiyasinya, who became professor of history at Columbia University, and had his, his tutelage on research under major Harrison of the history department of the School of Oriental and African Studies, introduces some novel ideas about the foundation of his kingdom. He says, that the army were the co-founders of this kingdom, and the chieftains were co subjects Of course, it looks, the terminology is very attractive, but when you scrutinize the ideas behind this, it is uh, baseless, it has no foundation for because of two reasons. There was no permanent army which was centralized and under the control of a single unit. The armies were under the control of the five chieftains. Of these were mobilized under their command and that of the reserve was under them and one of the chieftains led them in the rebellions against the monarch of Kota. Parakramabhu the sixth, <coughs> who according to the literary tradition, which is very erroneous and creates a wrong impression, he brought the whole island under his umbrella of government. People may imagine now that the entire island was integrated to become parts of a single kingdom. This never happened like that. But textbooks and even university historians in other parts of the island propagated this idea. That is the very special reason about which I may not explain now. So, 
Then he says that the chitans, the five chitans, were the four sovereigns. If you say sovereigns, the kingdom about which you are speaking of must be an independent entity. Udaraka was not an independent entity. Another historian contributing to the same volume and who had his radio passion and trying at the same university here and also in London and also under the same supervisor gives a rather sober and realistic description of the phenomenon. He says that there are some other who can become an independent ruler. His efforts twice were foiled by those of the royal armies of Porto. So he was paying tribute to Porto and at the same time sending some sections of the Canadians to render Rajapariya, that is, service to the king of Porto. So, there is uh, this contradiction in the university history of Sulon Volume 2. So now, we need that aside. The first, uh, then, a nationalistic interpretation of early modern history and medieval history of the Indian Kingdom like that of any other state in South Asia is totally irrelevant and anachronistic because the Kandian rulers at certain points of time they feared that they would be ousted and their realm will be conquered by the neighbors in Pote and Sitaba. Mayadana was uh, becoming very strong. Kote was becoming very weak and sometimes he got their support in his attacks on Kandy. On the second time, he conducted a full-scale attack. The Kandians, by diplomacy, both the rural of Kote and he withdrew his troops from the field and so Mayadana could not make any success. But the rulers of Kandy were prepared to invite the Portuguese against their fellow Sinhala kings, that is against Mayadana, as well as against Port. So if that were so, you can say that they were nationalistic in their motivations. If they were nationalistic in their motivations, they should have helped their neighbors in their struggles against both the Portuguese. That is not Then, more than one, one occasion, the country rulers offered to become Christians if the Portuguese would give them military support. Then, the greatest king among the Kenyans was undoubtedly Rajas in the second. He had a long reign. He is also one of the greatest rulers in the annals of the island's history. Despite his continuous war against the Portuguese, there were rebellions against him in, in the Ukrainians. Undeterred by these rebellions, he continued the war. And he reversed the policies of his predecessors. Vimalada Prasuriya. And his brother Asenara, they postulated a situation where there would be a three power presence in the island. The Portuguese in the entire low country, by 1591, they have established their power, reduced Pote and also Sitabate, and then the Kingdom of Japna from which Kandy did not face any threat. So they thought 
that they could coexist with the Portuguese power in the low country. But the Portuguese fought other things. They believed that uh, women of the school year was an apostate. After having been baptized, he had renounced to Buddhism. So he had to be punished. And he had no legitimacy to occupy the throne of Kali. So when uh, and they were constantly invading the territories of this kingdom, therefore Rajas in the second. During his father, there was a treaty in 1670. Despite and they recognized Senara as a king of men. But and also, in a certain way, it was stated that the boundaries of the kingdom extend to Trundamali in the north, in the east, and up to including vertical road to Panama in the eastern coast. Nevertheless, before the ink on the treaty dried up, they occupied Trundamali and Vertical. This happened before Rajasinya succeeded to the throne. It will be very boring to you, but the details are all given in the papers, in the presentation, the papers. And uh, Rajasinya felt there cannot be any coexistence with the Portuguese, and as long as they are established in some parts of the island, there is no security for the Indian king. He claimed that the entire, he was the king of the whole population. He said, not one group of people, all the ethnic groups, all the races of this country are my subjects. This was the position he took. And at the same time, in his long struggle, the governments in the East Coast, without exception, supported him without any reservation in the struggle against the Portuguese. Now, we now come on to what was this kingdom and the administration of this kingdom. There is a flood of literature on the Kandyan kingdom. This was the last kingdom. It had uh, continuously at different stages interacted very closely and in hostility with the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British. You have a large extent of documents in the Portuguese archives in Goa and in Brisbane. You have Dutch records here in Karabu, at the head, and in Jakarta in Danish. And a still larger volume of records in English are found concentrated in the archives in Karabu and in the British Museum, uh, British colonial archives in Karabu. But unfortunately, the large volume still remains unexplored. Another important source of material are the sun masses. Sun masses are not inscriptions on stone or copper plates. The grants made by the kings or the others were recorded in farm leaves, Tarikot farm leaves. These are found in hundreds, several hundreds, even in the south, although there are many universities and history departments, similar departments and others. They have not successfully collected them, studied, deciphered them, published them, and the contents remain unknown to even professional in history. So all these are very vast amount of materials. 
Don't they use? You need not go into all of these things. You know something. The basic information about the kingdom. The icons in the conquest, the temporal and spiritual conquest of Salon, as I told you, where they told you by Queros. But that is not very relevant for our purpose. The Dutch archives are full of records about the relations, about the description of the monarchy, and the conduct of affairs by the government of the country. More important for our purpose are the works of some British authors and chroniclers who are contemporary observers of the phenomenon, the phenomenon of Indian administration. They are uh, Henry Marshall, Major Day, uh, then uh, uh, Robert Fraser, and James Corey. The fifth one is more important because it gives a complete description of the constitution of the Canadian Kingdom. This is by Doyle, who was the first resident administering the Canadian provinces since their conquest by the British. Much of the material about the description is selected by me from that, his work and also of uh, Robert Preston. So, when you think of the government of a dynastic state in South Asia, we will leave the Middle East out for a while because their perceptions and fundamental principles are different. For them, you have to submit to the authority of the ruler. He is the head of the religion, religion and society. They accept a sort of absolutism. Whereas in the South Asian tradition, there is no prescription that the monarchy should be an absolute power. Now Europeans naturally, because they have come from lands accustomed to the traditions of constitutional monarchy, viewed and understood the system against the background of their own country. So Doyle, when he describes the king, he says, the power of the king is absolute and supreme. The council can tender advice, but cannot control his will. The king has the power of making peace and war, and he enacts ordinances, and he has control of the judicial administration, and he hears sometimes and conducts judicial proceedings in original jurisdiction for requests. That means he had control over the administration somewhat. Control means you should not think or try to equate with the executive presidency introduced by Java. I will come to that later by way of context. He had judicial powers but he had no legislative competence. The South Asian monarchy, except under the Mauryas, they never had legislative competence. Of course, South India, the most famous of political thinkers in this subcontinent, he postulated a state which was more or less absolute in character which could undertake changes in the economy, 
in the improductive enterprises by using arbitrary power. But normally, in Indian practice and tradition, they rejected this because Arthur Shastra was not comprehensible to them. So in the Hindu theory, derived from the Vedic tradition, the power of the monarch was very limited because they said there are four sources of law. What are they? Dharma, Charitra, Bhyavakara, Rajasasana. Dharma is a precept initiated by the elite academics who are compiling digests of law. So this is, comes first. Digests of law, proclaiming, recording ideals and practices. The second is Charitra, that is the the base, the traditions of the elite. I don't want to explain any further what the elite are. Not exclusively the Brahmins, huh? Some Westerners and our local people, many university people think that these are the pen products of Brahmins. It was meant for the whole society. <coughs> we have a harder, is the the compendium. They were not uh, compiled, but the set of the uh, decisions of law courts. At the bottom is the Rajasasana, the ordinance of the king. And after having said this, they said that the among all these four, every preceding one has precedence or over the following item or items. What does it mean? The monarchy cannot be despotic. It cannot make laws. It only administers the law. So in the traditional Asian, South Asian system, including that of Sri Lanka, the king was a custodian of the laws, not a maker of the laws. Such a conception goes against the theory of absolutism. Why they speak of this absolute monarch is because the uh, ritual uh, performances or manifestations of a theatrical uh, representation of the conception of an uh, the imagining notions of a sacerdotal being with which the monarch is personified. Not in reality, but in perception. So, when the English and other Europeans witnessed the proceedings of the royal court of its assembly. They were astonished and they found there was no notion of equality, no liberty among four, among the dignitaries. But they, what happened was that nobody could approach the king at close distance. And the dignitaries, even the highest ones, when they go close to him, they have to prostrate three times. And in the process, recite a string of eulogies, which have no relation, but they are, they are gardens of grandly open terms, describing the monarch. They have no relevance to reality. And the government, the king, of course, but I told you, was at the apex of the system. He, although sometimes in cases, made the appointments of all principal dignitaries in the kingdom. 
But there was a special arrangement of a poor administration in this kingdom. Some of you who may have had the fortune to study the history of modern India may be familiar with the, the role of the Peshwas in the history of the Marathas. Shivaji was the first founder of the Maratha state, but subsequently, for several generations, the administration was conducted by the Peshwas on a territory basis. This system is somewhat similar to that of the Adigars in the Kandyan kingdom. These Kandyan Adigars, of course, uh, they had their prototypes in the Kampura kingdom. The contributors to the University of Ceylon, history of Ceylon, on this through volume two imagine that the system of appointing Adigars was introduced by the kings of the Islam. The tradition was already there in the Gampara Kingdom. Because in inscriptions, particularly the, the Langa Telaga inscriptions, engraved both in Sinhala and Tamil, there are references to Adidas. Sena Langa Adikar and Vesadika. The first one is described this guy as Mantri Fresh, the first Radhika, and the foremost among ministers. This was the position of the Radhikas under the Kandyan kingdom. This designation was borrowed or adapted from an earlier tradition. These Radhikas, uh, the number was increased to three by the last king. So they had the uh, unprecedented uh, as ministers, powers, and functions. No legislative functions, of course. They had administrative functions, judicial functions, and military functions. Because the uh, armies of the kingdom, in its wars against others, were led by the Maha Adhika. The first Adhika, who has the designation Adhikrashiranadipati. So it is due to Adhikras to speak of a permanent army with a elected or a commander appointed on a permanent basis. These two phenomena never exist. So then this, uh, what was the they were known as Pande Gampate Adhika and Uda Gampate Adhika. I don't want to go into with many terms with which you are not familiar. They are, these two had each uh, five villages assigned to them. So each Adhika on appointment had to pay to the king 500 Vedi. You must know that the economy of the Indian kingdom was not monetized. Really is a poor form of pieces of silver. Some of them are in the position of Professor Pushparatma in his future. And uh, there never no king after the 13th century, after the fall of Polanova. Except the Arya Chakravarti issued gold and silver coins. Earlier we had some suspicion about it, but uh, Professor Pushparatnam, when he was conducting surveys in the Kunar district area, he made the came across a gold coin and a silver coin, and many of them, others, had been lost. Ote did not issue these coins, such coins. Tampala rulers did not. And Kandyans, of course, did not issue any such coin. This region, 
three beans, a piece of twisted piece of three, three pieces of silver bent together. Then the Adiga, the they did these five villages assigned to them. They were occupied specially by three categories of people, the Katukula, who were messengers of the Aligarh of the king. They communicated messages from them to officials in Kandi and to the Rishabas and their, their underlings. Then there were a group of people who were the Kasaka, big crackers. It was a ritual. It was not an administrative duty. Like many of the designations of the Anuradha period, which students are forced to memorize by the present dons in the universities when they said question papers. They have no administrative, uh, you see, uh, value, connotations. They were, they were worn by people who performed some ritual tasks. Is it necessary to memorize that difficult part it take term? It is always happened in this wonderful state of ours and the system of education. Then the Adidas uh, were present when the king conducted religious proceedings. Then they were also conducting the judicial proceedings at the Mahanadwa, the highest court in the kingdom, and also it was an appeals court. And the decisions were written and with the, an issue with their signatures. And they first conveyed these decisions to the king. And the business of government in an assembly was conducted by whispers, they don't speak like this. This is anathema to the Indian administration. This is heresy. The king communicates in the form of whispers to the Aliga. And he also does similarly, but he is not standing on the same uh, step at, on, right, on which the throne is placed. These two steps here below the form. And in a similar fashion, he conveys, conveys, transmits these messages to the assembly. Now we come to the disharmonies. What are the disharmonies? The kingdom was divided into 21 provinces. Large provinces were 12 disharmonies surrounding the Kauri. You can imagine the Mansaya who look at Mans. Then uh, the Kauri region was divided into nine small provinces called Ratas. Rata also who come across in the Mahabharata in relation to the centuries. So these were uh, the chieftains who were Rathe Rada, so Rathe Mahatma. These were all appointed by the king in consultation with the Adhika. Now the authority of the king and power of the king ceases when we go to the Disharmonies. The disharmonies were divided into four relays. Four relays into Hattus. And several villages consisted from Hattu here, single Hattu. So in the administration at the apex was the monarch, supported by the Aligas. At the bottom was the Buddha. More than the term was applied here also by the British then. So, in this kingdom, territorial administration and the, the highest <coughs> ranks of government in the at the capital were exclusive monopoly 
falta coita más. Coita más para los cucas de arriba. Los who very high positions of rank in regional and central administration. There is no central administration, but for the time being, he looks the term. But it doesn't mean that the, there was very much big pressure, no oppression of the other class. All these dignitaries of the Oigaba caste. The new restriction was only over the Boigama people, population. There was a separate arrangement for the non Goigamas. It was not a territorial character, it was extra territorial. The headmen were referred to as Dore. And these were functioning under Greater chiefs called Muhammad. These were all appointed by the Dishaba. The Dishaba appointed all the subordinate forces. So there is despotism, there is centralized monarchy. In their own way, they have the powers of the king in their territories, in a hierarchical order. The artists and communities, the beavers, and similarly others who performed certain distinctive functions which were important for society, religious services and processions, and royal processions. They had their own arrangement, they were under a separate administration. And at the same time, as there was plenty of land, large extents of land, all these were given land assignments. I don't think that uh, the theory of the king's ownership of land could be sustained, but unlike in the Gatna kingdom, the land tenure system in the south was very different. In the north, it was all private holding. There was nothing for it. The royal uh, villages or properties and lands belonging to the king, which he gave granted to them. So, mm, the administration was governed by two factors. It was governed by land and produce of the land. These were the remuneration given to for service to the chieftains at different levels. And there was a caste system. And services were, which were functional were associated with specific groups called caste. When the Kentian kings under the Nayakas, uh, they introduced a certain innovation. When there were poor relatives of the Nayaks of Madhu, some or other, the Kentian chiefs were told of another, brought them here without the knowledge of the Nayak of Madhu. When they came here, they were raised to the dignity of kingship. And it was an unexpected uh, boom. So they embraced Buddhism. The Nayakas were not to, rulers were not Hindus. And they also brought a large retinue and kinsmen, like the kind of princes who came in the 11th, 12th centuries. He stayed, they stayed at the King Kandy, there is a street called Parava Street, it was originally occupied by the relatives of the Nayaka Buddha who came. But somehow there, like, interestingly, there was a great revival of Buddhism under the Nayaka people. Before the Nayaka came, maybe because of the destruction of social life, 
and the economy by its culture policies adopted by the Portuguese. The whole society was dislocated, like ours that was dislocated during the 30 years of war. But the other temples and Brahmins remained and performed their functions despite so much of humiliation. The monks will not. So there were no modern monks. <coughs> Can you imagine? In the 17th, 18th century, there were no modern monks in the whole country. So the predecessor of Kirtisli Rajasim sent emissaries to the king of Siam. The first one was a misfit. The Portuguese vessel which brought the monk had sunk to Trinity. They used Portuguese vessels also for this purpose. There is war and there is sometimes some understanding. Intermittently they change from one to the other. And the second mission was under the Sri So the Swamish monks came and ordained quite a number of local persons and, uh, and that led to the emergence of a fraternity of monks because under the Siyam Nikaya, some of you may not know what this Nikaya is. In the olden days, those who study, study, know the Churamsa, Mahamsa, know that for about 1,200 years since the reign of Sukhagadini, there were three Nikayas. Not much of doctrine and dependence, but some two of them were came under Mahayana influence. But these three Nikayas in the current period are fundamentally developed. In the CM Nikaya, like only the Bhagavas can be ordained. They may speak so many things, you see, now. But they will not ordain a monk Bhagavan into the sun. I said, monk. So, under the British, because of this deficiency in the Buddhist conversation, the postal people, the Karavas, they went to Burma and brought monks to ordain non Goigama, non Goigama people. And they established two Nikayas. <coughs> One is the called Ramanya Nikaya, the Amarapura Nikaya. The two chapters of the CM Nikaya are the Asturiya and Malvata chapters. There is no distinction in any, any other thing, only physical distinction in the in their operation and organization. Two chapters of the same order. What Rajasinya did, this way Rajasinya did, politically his uh, reign was a thing. At a flop, the Chulamansa has a very long eulogistic account, like in the form of a carpet poem of this king because of their own reasons. There is not a single reference to the touch. And it was under him that uh, the Treaty of 1766 was signed and can be seen that all the coastal littoral parts in the east and in the south. It became reduced to a land of kingdom. But despite that, and by at the same time putting it under the carpet, the orders of the Mahavansha represent the king this way as a great king because he introduced certain innovations in Buddhism. He adopted phenomenal Buddhism as an instrument to bring about social cohesion among the various groups of people and also to establish an emotional 
day, between the monarchy and the inhabitants of the realm, in this, huh? in this, oh, in this he was eminently successful. Now we come to the third part. The Gandhi included the eastern littoral, which was entirely occupied by the Tamils and also by Muslims, living around four towns and the commercial centers. This territory was divided into twelve principalities, four in the Trikamaniya region and the other eight in what they call the Matakara Pudesh. And these Vanyas had full control of the local administration. They collected all the revenues. They were in charge of the judicial administration. They had military power as indicated in this printed version of my talk. Not only that, they were considered a very honorable position in the proceedings of government of the capital. They were members, all these one years, were members of the king's council. And for instance, when there was a discussion about the succession, the king fell in and he thought an arrangement has to be made for the succession. The king would not perhaps nominate the successor without the consent of the council. So once that was made, and also there was an arrangement, the transition arrangement before the successor could be drawn uh, after the death of the king. So, the honor of uh, inviting the prince to this assembly was conferred on Vidali, the chieftain of Kotiyar which is indicated in the maps as a kingdom. Robert Knox, a map is formed in the, uh, in the book written by him and published there. There, Kotiyaran is not referred to as a principality. It, it is said that it is Ratnam Kotiya. Ratnam means kingdom. Similarly, Badikalo is what we call Badikalo now was a principality of Manmohan. That was the largest and the most powerful principality there. It is also indicated in maps as Ratnam Kotiya. You see, in you know, our history, they know these things. They don't want to record these things. They falsify it, distort history, and force it through state agencies of the field. That is why people behave in a very dissimilar fashion in comparison to the citizens in other parts of the world, even in the neighboring countries of Southeast Asia. History, I told you about it. Have you said some uh, uses last time? Yeah, there are distortions. These are these distorted versions are transmitted not only by university teachers but also by school teachers and in publications by the government department. So this is an important aspect. And uh, only after 66, 1766, these monuments were removed from that. And uh, whenever disputes arose among them, they were summoned to the council and inquiries were held. Once uh, there was an accusation because some of these monuments were hostile to one another in order to take advantage, they made very grave and false accusations against their heads. 
though they are summoned to court, and sometimes a nephew, the succession to the designation, the rank of Bhagavanā, was not permanent yet. Even in Trindamani, as in Vatikaro, it was matrilineal. So when Nadali was accused, he was ill. He sent his nephew to Kandy. And he indicated very ably the innocence of his uh, master. And so the uh, accusations were all cast aside and he was exonerated from death. But at the same time, uh, the chieftain of Panama, who was accused of treachery because he had contacted the Portuguese and promised many concessions to them. So an army of 30,000 was sent from to attack him under the chieftains and the people who were around because they would play the country best. There is nothing called David of Sunan, nationalism goes in those days. Nationalism came with the French Revolution. If you speak of nationalism in the University of this year, so long, they speak of some sort of nationalism before that day. Nothing of that sort. So, the one year of one went to Kandy, he went to the he was received with honors. After trial, he was found guilty of treason from death to death and executed in Kent. Now, the ethnic diversity in the Kenyan kingdom was largely because arose because of the inclusion of the Eastern people which was predominantly dominated, uh, inhabited by farmers. Now I would say that the Kandian monarchy, through a recognition of ethnic diversity and by policies of tolerance in matters of religion, and this custodial functions, irrespective of ethnic and other sectarian differences, was able to develop traditions of harmony, peace, interethnic collaboration, and coordination, and also solidarity and unity, particularly in times of facing enemies, the Portuguese or the Dutch. Now I conclude uh, with this statement that the monarch of those days did never had the powers of the executive president. The powers of the executive president are higher than that of any British monarch after George the Third. You know that George the Third ruled. George the Third, after him, no, no ruler of Britain, dismissed Parliament at his own will. Unless he sought the advice of the Prime Minister, and it is accordingly, according to his advice, that he either uh, dismissed Parliament and appointed the government of ministers. So now, the glorious and exemplary traditions of our country, which were developed during 2,000 years of uh, long history had been cast away by us. And particularly those people who had come to dominate this country despite their moral education, despite their understanding of law. The only exception was S.W.R.D. Uh, I want to, I don't want to explain that first. Some of you may be angry when I say this, but he is the one who, who, who understood the working of the system in the past, and that is why he said in 1926 after he, a few years after, soon after he returned from Oxford,
but that a highly centralized system of government is alien to the traditions of this country. The local missionaries, the Kandians, and the Sri Lankan Tamils have developed their own identity, particularly in language and in administration and laws, religion and culture. No others, the latest realized it knew about it. They spoke of class, but people could not understand. And I also would say, and what do I say? Because there are many distinctions. The Singhala Mahasabha founded by him was not an anti government It was a movement designed to revive the Singhalese culture and their place in the island, which was very much depressed during foreign rule. It was subsequently, but that rule is very different. So we may not think about it now, but we must have some understanding of the past, the present. Of course, we have to bear the burdens of inequality and depression. But at the same time, in this world, no state can include the traditions of this country as well as the ideals and practices universally and internationally accepted. So you have to live with hope. Thank you for listening to me. Nama Dewi Perwira Kalayati, Mumpati Nalawa Dewi Pantai Mani Perwira Kalayati, Nelam Sarapan Cetum Mahi, Nama Dewi Perwira Kalayati, Kandi Rakyat. Nama Dewi Perwira Kalayati, Sarapan Cetum Mahi, Nama Dewi Perwira Kalayati, 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 Nama Dewi Perwira Kalay Malangnya kerja, nan mula ni le, ini orang dia, anggota kem permal tu cuma dia, ini orang dia main dari ke, nan di bawah ni le, apa benda? Adil, parat ke channel orang macam ni le, adil, ada umumnya ada apa kerja, apa ada pun tu perlu dal, ada apa ada. Sila nokan dari kahwin kiri buat kita pada zaman itu, apa ada sila boleh kahwin ada pria apa alatkan pada pada kuriya karma yang ada di sana, entah itu kat sini lah, kau di khati, yang pernah rasa kat sini, mana orang orang ke orang area orang ini barang ini, ini ada benda rawat kal, ada ni opium. Maka ini, ini, ini yang kita nak ini, ini orang pelajar yang rasa ini, adikara, pakai tu, ini yang kita sahaja baru, ini nak kita ini beri beri nama kita 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 Indah ini yang urai, orang berlalu ke awam mata, berlalu samar terpatah orang beri mata um, indah awam itu, adik nelayan indah awam ini potong urai, orang berlalu ke awam mata, pada halat itu kuda padam, kacau ini dorang, ini anda, wajar tu le, firman itu kuriya ayah awak kerjai. Engkau dia nanti ye, nanti mula lile pura. Inda zaman awal tu peru dia i, awal, lepada tu udah ikhlas, awal inda lepada itu le potir par, inda lepada itu tetapi ninggal, inda awan itu i par pun bodoh, awal dia kani rancak koran le, awal potsta, pura i kerja pun bodoh, mungkin kalau kita nanggil tu, awal lepada tu me, saya nuri ya, kelbi. Pula macam tu, orang beli ni leh rendu, oh itu betul ni leh. Tapi eksak terasa ni raka, orang ingom, tanur dia ajar pada ini, kalap panik pada ini, 
முக்கியமாக களப்பணிகளையும் இன்றும் நேற்றும் நாளையும் செய்து கொண்டிருக்கின்றார் இப்பொழுது கூட அவர் அந்த வயதிலே ஈடுபட்டிருப்பதை அறியக்கூடியதாக இருக்கின்றது எனவே இவை எல்லாம் இன்னும் சிறப்பாக நடைபெற வேண்டும் என்று வேண்டிக் கொண்டு இந்த ஒரு அரிய வாய்ப்பை அளிப்பதற்கும் இதனை ஒழுங்குபடுத்துவதற்கும் அனுமதியையும் மிகவும் பொருத்தமான ஆலோசனைகளையும் நல்லதொரு முறையிலே எங்களுக்கு இந்த நிகழ்ச்சிக்கு எங்களுக்கு எல்லோருக்கும் அன்பாக தெரிந்த பேராசிரியர் அவர்களை பற்றிய அவருடைய புலமைத்துவ பின்புலங்களை பற்றி அழகாக எங்களுக்கு வரவுத்துறையை வழங்கியிருந்த எங்களுடைய அன்புக்குரிய தலைசார் பேராசிரியர் கந்தசாமி எங்களுடைய கவிதி வாங்கிய அதிகாரி அவர்களுக்கும் என்னுடைய நன்றிகளை இந்த வழியிலே தெரிவித்துக் கொள்கிறேன் இந்த மண்டபத்திலே எவ்வளவோ பல்வேறு வேலைகளை ஆசிரியர்கள் புலமைத்துவ மிக்க சமூக ஆர்வலர்கள் அதே நேரத்திலே கௌரவ பாராளுமன்ற உறுப்பினர் திரு மாவே சேனாதிராஜா மதிப்புக்குரிய யாழ்ப்பாண பல்கலைக்கழகத்து வவுனியா விழாக முதல்வர் மற்றும் இங்கே குழுமியிருக்கின்ற சிரேஷ்ட பேராசிரியர்கள் பேராசிரியர்கள் சிரேஷ்ட விரிவுரையாளர்கள் விரிவுரையாள உத்தியோகத்தர்கள் ஊழியர்கள் எங்கள் எங்கள் அன்புக்குரிய எங்களுடைய மாணவர்கள் அனைவருக்கும் இந்த பேருரையிலே கலந்து சிறப்பிப்பதற்கு சிறப்பித்ததற்காக என்னுடைய சிறிய சொற்ப கால அவகாசம் தான் எங்களால் எங்களுடைய கல்வி வழியேற்று திணைக்களத்திற்கு கொடுத்த போதும் போன ஒரு மாதமாக அவர்கள் பணி சுமை பணி என்பதனை சிலமே கொண்டு உடனடியாக இந்த விழாவுக்குரிய முறையான ஏற்பாடுகளை அழகாக செய்து தந்த எங்களுடைய கல்விக்கு நிலையை சேர்ந்த உதவி பதிவாளர் அவர்களுக்கும் அவருடைய உத்தியோகத்தர்கள் பீடாதி அவர்களுக்கும் எல்லோரும் என்னுடைய